All right, we want to welcome you to another edition, an episode of The Family Business Today. It's Steve Alessi, and I have somebody new that I want to introduce to everybody. His name is Jordan Rayner. Come on, podcast audience. Give him a good God bless you, man. Jordan, so glad to meet you today. I'm glad you can be on this Zoom with me. Steve, it's a joy to be with you. Perfect. Well, listen, we've connected not so much personally, but our staff and our team is yeah. connected because uh, of a resource that you've been to our office. You wrote a book called Redeeming the Time. And so Alan Paul, our producer of our podcast, has put that material before our staff and has really been helping them just be able to manage their time and their day. So we've already connected one way or the other. I love it. I love it. It's a good way to connect first on a useful piece of content, right? It is. It is. And that's been very helpful. So thanks for doing that. Here, Here's what I'd like our audience to know about. First, uh, you, uh, just to know you a little bit better, you're the author of a best-selling book called Called to Create, Master of One and Redeeming Your Time. So you're busy writing. That's good. You have downloadable devotionals on version that they can pick up. Uh, that deals with faith and your work. Uh, you have a new children's book called The Creator in You that's coming out in April. So right here, it's with us. You live in Tampa, so you're a Floridian. You're married. You've got three kids. And I believe one of your children are adopted. That's right. That's hey, you beautiful. nailed it. Yep. Uh, you've been you've been well prepped. Yes, we have. And something that's just as impresses, impressive is you've hung around the White House a little bit back when Bush occupied the office. Yeah, it was a good good time. Lots wow. of stories. Yeah, and just for the sake of clarity, I'm not that old. I was in W's White House <laughs> uh, back in 2006. That's cool. And then yeah. you left your CEO position that you had. And now you're focusing on family and running your own business. So, uh, man, just greet our audience, if you will, for a minute, and yeah. uh, we'll take it from there. No, it's so good to be here. Yeah, I, I um, my mission in life is to help Christ followers understand that what we do in this life deeply matters for eternity. And, you know, I spent, as you alluded to, spent 10 years, well, spent one life in politics, Spent another life running tech startups, uh, and I, I have the blessing now of spending pretty much all my time today creating content around these ideas, right? Uh, whether that's nonfiction books or podcasts, uh, and now obviously with this with this first picture book uh, called "The Creator and You" for my kids and for the kids and all the lives of your listeners. That is great, buddy. So let's uh, talk business and family here. Our, yeah. our, our podcast is The Family Business with the Alessis, and we have our tagline where family is everybody's business. Now, here's the part. The, the whole thing about the, the business and family is not only do we work together and us being in the ministry, we have a unique opportunity that I do work with my adult kids. And that's great. And that's that's one aspect, just trying to juggle that and make it happen. I always said that I'd be judged not so much by the sermon that we preach or the songs that we sing, but by the kids that I raise. And so our kids are doing pretty good at this point along the way that are adults and I'll have a grandchild coming up soon. So so life's pretty good as we we handle that. But, you know, here's what happens with the same principles that we use in our ministry are actually the principles that we got to use in raising our kids. And the same principles that we use in raising our kids are pretty much the same uh, principles that we use in building a church because we are a family. And so when we get down to talking about family and what we do in ministry, what we're finding more than ever is the battle, the bombardment that is coming against our kids. If the enemy can get them while they're young, then he's pretty much got a stronghold on them when they're old. And here you have this beautiful book. Now, now you left a seven-figure income to more or less work at home, be close to your family, and now you've put a resource out there directed to your kids and all these other children. 
Now, what made you actually do that? Why are kids the family? Why is it so important to you? Oh, man, because uh, there's a biblical mandate to be really good at this, I think. <laughs> right. I, 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 I thought a lot about this throughout my career and I, I'm hesitant to go down. I think it's a slippery slope to say, you know, God first, family second, work third, because I never see Jesus making a list of priorities in this way. Um, and I think it's a, I think it's a false trap. All of these things, it's God first, everything else second. Sure. Right? My work is important. My family is important. But while I don't assign hierarchy to them, I do think parenting my kids is my most unique work, right? Yeah. God can use anybody, call anybody to do the work I'm doing in the world, but he's called me alone to be the father to my children yeah. and the husband to my bride. It's what just gives extra weight to that. I, I, I hesitate to call it more important because, uh, again, I don't see biblical precedent for it, but it is more unique and so um, for me, as I'm evaluating where to invest my time and energy, I want to focus as much as I can on the callings that I can most uniquely occupy in this world, right? And for me, that meant, yeah, traveling a lot less in a mm -hmm. very lucrative job, uh, but saying no to that so I could be home more frequently uh, and meet the needs of my my young kids and my young family. Yeah, uh, that's good. That's well said. Because look, it, it's it's really about a balance. And here's what we yeah. we do. It it it's mandatory. I don't care who you are and what you do on a at a career level. If you don't bring that enthusiasm back home with you, the same way that you you balance everything on the in the workplace, if you don't bring some measure of that back home then you're definitely going to find your family life and your kids. You're going to find something lacking. And the sad thing is there, as we know, Jordan, most of the time you realize that information, if something's wrong, it's too late. Yeah, that's exactly right. I I've been asking this question a lot over the last few years. Am I being as strategic and intentional with my family as I am with my work? Mm -hmm. And most of the time, the answer to that question is no. I think the answer for most of us in this world is no, we're not. And that's just irrational, mm -hmm. right? It, it actually like doesn't make yeah. sense when you put yeah. it in those terms. And so we got to work at it. We've got to work at being intentional. Uh, and, and, and it's part of the reason why I've gotten uh, into writing these books for kids. I've, I've made a career now in writing books for adults. I'm like, man, I want to be really... And so last night, we actually just got the very first copies in our house of this new children's book, The Creator and You. And it was like such a joy watching my seven-year-old without mm -hmm. me asking, take the book, go sit on the stairs and read the whole thing and like delight. Yeah. In it, oh, right. That like that was the joy yeah. of this whole project. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, then tell me this, okay. Just from your yeah. experience, um, what's the best way these days to keep the family connected? Okay. Because mm -hmm. here we're dealing with so many fragmented families. Yeah. And even though we may be under the same roof, we've got kids that are being pulled away on their cell phones and social media. There's a language. I don't know when it is the last time you looked at the language of a teenager via text. Dude, it, it's a totally different language that they speak with all of their little deals. But they're being pulled away. There's, there's a social media pulling them away. You can take them to dinner and have a wonderful time spending a lot of money, but your kids with their phones being right there cannot even be in the moment. They could be gone yep. and it's a wasted yep. opportunity. So how, how can we help people today keep the family connected? Yeah, it's such a good question. I, I, think, I think what's going to be way more effective than rules is an uber compelling alternative to what our kids are finding on their phones. And I think that it, what, what that looks like are households marked by defiant joy, right? Right, right. Just, we are the house, we are the family that has fun. And so one way that we're doing that real practically with young kids is opening and enjoying the God-given gift of Sabbath hmm. every week. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, my kids, 
I have young kids, seven, sure. five, and two. And my five-year-old in particular, she has no concept of time, right? Mm-hmm. And so she, every morning, when she almost every morning when she walks out of her room, she goes, Dad, is it Sabbath Sunday yet? They are. My kids are excited <laughs> about Sabbath because that is a day of the week that is filled with good, joyful things. Sabbath in our home is not what I viewed Sabbath as growing up, as this legalistic, life-sucking day filled with things I couldn't do. Sabbath in the Rainer household is, I, I think, the, the biblical vision of Sabbath. What Jesus said Sabbath was, it was for man. It's a day filled with good things that we get to do rather than a day filled of things we have to do. And so as we're thinking about our kids getting older, we're getting even more serious about Sabbath in particular. This one day a week, like I, I told my wife the other day, I'm like, when our kids are grown, Lord willing, if they're living in the same city, I want them to not even be able to fathom not coming over to mom and dad's house for mm. Sabbath because it is such a a deep well of joy and goodness, right? Yeah. And so, I, again, I think part of combating the smartphone thing and our kids being distracted all the time is just being really intentional about cultivating amazing, loving, and joy-filled environments at home. Yeah. Well, the word there is intentionality. We have yeah. to be thinking about it. It has to be a priority. I always said this, man, down in South Florida, and you know this, being on the bay there yeah. in uh, Tampa, I didn't want my kids excited about going else on, going out on somebody else's boat. I wanted to have a boat. I wanted them to know, man, hey, let's hang out with dad, mom, and couldn't always afford those things, but it was to me, I looked at it as an investment. I wanted yeah. to make sure the kids were along. And when they were younger... You know, it was fun and exciting when they start hitting their teens and they have options. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, there's m- even more intentionality that is needed, yeah. which it's uh, I guess the answer here is this. It's possible. Yes. Culture does not have to win this particular war here with the kids mm-hmm. and the family. We can win by being intentional and making sure that we're connected at home. Now, I always said to my kids, uh, Jordan, that, listen, I'm not going to be your best friend, at least when I'm a, when, when they're young. I'm not going right. to be their best friend. I'm going to be the disciplinarian. I've got to be right. the leader. And, and you don't have to like me. You do got to respect me. But mm-hmm. as they got older, I always told them, but I'll probably most likely be your only friend hanging out <laughs> as you do get older. That's right. Because <laughs> all those friends That's you right. hang out with when you're a kid, man, they're gone. You know, yeah, that's right. How many year old buddies you hang out with from school? That's right. Yeah, very few. I'll say this too. I, I I think I think part of keeping kids engaged is not just joy, but it's also um helping them discover deep eternal purpose for their lives. Kids are walking around consuming so much because they just lack purpose in their lives. I was speaking at an event the other day, and I was asked the question, you know, Jordan, why uh, are so many young kids falling away from the church? I was like, yeah, listen, we see these statistics all the time. And every time we see a new one, we love blaming culture. Mm. We love blaming liberals. But I think we got to look ourselves in the eye and start to blame ourselves. Because here's the deal. We have distilled the gospel. What Jesus called the gospel of the kingdom, right? To the gospel of me, right? This idea that the gospel is about Jesus coming to save me from my individual sins. And that's it. If that's it. Then after I walk the aisle and pray the prayer, I got nothing to do Mm -hmm. and I'm bored. Maybe I share the gospel a couple of times throughout my life, but I'm not a quote unquote full-time missionary. And so I just lack purpose in my life. And so I think as parents, we can help our kids see, hey, hold up, hold on a second. Your purpose is right there in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. This is what my children's book, The Creator and You, is all about. You're created to fill and subdue the earth. And when you do, you bring glory to the Father. You're called not just to make disciples, but to make the kingdom, right? So as we help our kids unpack this deep and wide purpose, biblical purpose for their lives, yeah, I think the other things of this world look less attractive because they just can't satisfy relative to that epic vision for their lives. Good, good. Well, that's why to us and what we do, our, our, our family business, our ministry is a family affair for us. And if it's a family yeah. affair for us, we intentionalize trying to make it a family affair for others. Because having those kids in the house of God with them, age-appropriate material uh, environments for them is so important. Parents, yeah. 
can't hardly go to church for themselves anymore when they get young kids. Yeah. Because if they go for themselves, they're probably not going most of the time. They've yeah. got to put their kids before them, say, man, I, those kids need to be there. Because as we know, parents, uh, kids do what a parent does. Yeah. And so if we're not there, they're not. Well, but so. then that brings me to this. You know, you, you talk about just showing them that future, that 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 destiny that's on their lives as a kid. H- how can a parent be teaching their kid these principles today? How, how could they be enforcing godly principles on their kids or in their kids' lives? And what I'm talking about here is many of, uh, now, now we preach the love of Jesus, but how about something as simple as kindness? How about something as, as, as nice as politeness? How about sexuality? Yeah. Let's get down. How yeah. about the gender-specific issues that yeah. t- today there's a segment in society that's trying to force down our kids' throats? How do we, as a parent, teach them the right principles? Mm. It's a good question. I mean, I think it starts with cultivate a love of God. Because if you don't love God, then you won't love His Word, and you won't love His laws, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I, I think it's recognizing that we have a good, good father. Who yeah. loves it and, and helping our kids understand um, the security of their identity as an adopted child of God through Jesus Christ, mm. right? Like we've got to hammer this into our kids before we teach any principle. They got to understand it's it's what I tell my kids every single night before I put them to bed. I say, "Hey, kids, you know Daddy loves you no matter how many bad things you do." And they say, "Yes." I say, "You know I also love you no matter how many good things." You do? And they say, yes. I say, who else loves you like that? And they say, Jesus, Mm -hmm. right? That's what our kids got to hear. That's their primary identity before sexual identity, before vocational identity, before political identity. They are an adopted son or daughter of the king, right? That's it. And until we get that straight, all this other stuff we're going to fail at. Yeah. We're going to lose the culture war yeah. unless we can help them get rooted in that identity in Christ. Are your kids in school? Homeschool? Yeah. Uh, no, they're not. They go to a public school here in Tampa, uh, and they're young. So seven, uh, yeah, seven, five, and two. So two of the three are in school. That's sweet. That's sweet. Well, yeah. there'll be a day when they're hearing about Will Smith punching Chris exactly. Rock and what, what's going to be, what's going to be the teaching at home on something like this? Cause you know, everybody in society thinks they're right. It's yeah. crazy how people in society can make wrong, right? Yeah. How nuts it's crazy. Is that? But that, that, you know what, when we are talking about these things, it, it's, 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 um, we try really hard to insulate rather than isolate our kids. Mm-hmm. Right. What I mean by that is they're exposed to a lot of lies in this world from uh, kids at school, from friends in the neighborhood, from teachers, from other adults, frankly, sometimes from their grandparents. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but 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 that's it. I think that's important because we're able to bring them home. This is discipleship. Yeah. I say, yeah. hey, kids, let's go to God's word. And we have a I have my huge Bible that I use for my quiet times every morning. It sits in the middle of our dining room table. And so if any conversation ever comes up, we just pull out God's word and say, yeah. what is truth? This is the source of truth. And let's go here. Don't trust dad. Don't mm. trust me even quoting some verse in the Bible. I want them to see it physically. Let's pull out the book. Let's read exactly what it says, because this is a reflection of God's character. Right. right? And as you get to know that character, you're going to love him and you're going to desire and long to submit to his law because you know it is good. Yeah. Well, I even tell my 30 year old Jordan who gets up and he's a great communicator. But I said to him after he got married about a year ago, I said, there's going to be a change right now. When you get up and you communicate, you say a lot of the times you'll say, well, my dad told me, my dad told me, my dad told me, but I know there's a day coming when no longer will you say, my dad told me even as a young man. And you're going to start to say, well, I heard from God. I read in the word. If we can do our part as men and, and uh, women as moms and dads, Okay. There's a few things we need to be able to say to our kids regularly. There's a few phrases 
that our kids need to be able to know, and they need to be biblical principles. They, they need yeah. to be life principles, kingdom principles. If we could learn first to live by them, like I always say to my kids, what do you think they're going to say about me when I'm gone? They're going to say, well, my dad always said, you lead by example, not by parking space. <laughs> All right. They, there's got to be some things that our kids are going to say that we always yeah. said that so, should lead them to a place that they knew, well, God said this as well. Yeah. So it's yeah. got to lead them. But there's intentionality to that. And yeah. teaching, the conversation, uh, it doesn't always have to be with the finger pointed, no. but it has to be from the heart saying, hey, man, this is what we do believe. Yeah, and it's always looking for opportunities, whether it's Will Smith at the Oscars or whatever's going on in the world, uh, what's going on in Ukraine, whatever, to take these current events and help them connect them, draw a line from those events back to the gospel mm. in everything, right? Yeah. And just looking for ways to be super intentional. And, and the truth is, this is exhausting, right? <laughs> but it's a man's job. Mm -hmm. It's a woman's job. Yep. We've got to man up. Right. Uh, and find the energy to do the real work of yeah. parenting, which is to be mentally aware all the time and bringing these conversations back to Jesus. Guy, I'll tell you, I, I've been around church my entire life and I've seen some guys in my position give more time to their staff, more intentional conversations and uh, discipleship and training to their staff than they do their own kids. And then they wonder why at the end of the day, their kids want nothing to do with the things of God. And it's yeah. the same. We'll give more attention out on our job. We'll focus harder on that uh, uh, upcoming meeting we're going to have. We'll give yeah. more of that. Then we come home and we're like a rag that's been ringed out. And we're like, man, we got nothing left to give. We have yeah. to still come to the table with something. So then help me do this. All right. Because we have, unfortunately, some prodigals that have uh, left the home. Um, they were put or raised in a godly home environment, but for whatever reason, they have chosen to step out of that environment. So what are we doing? Help, help me speak to the parent on how to deal with the prodigal child that has either left the home or left the values of the household or even yeah. left the faith. I don't know that I can answer this because um, my kids are young and I haven't had to experience this pain. But here's what I will say that you see consistently all throughout Scripture. Our job is faithfulness. God's job is fruitfulness. Say it again. We're not responsible. Say it again. Say it yeah, again. let me say it again. Our job is faithfulness. God's job is fruitfulness. You are not ultimately responsible for the decisions that your kids make in this life. And it's the height of arrogance to believe that we can be. God alone produces results through our work, whether that's work at an office or work inside the home. And that takes us off the hook for the results. Now, it also leads us to great responsibility and doing our part. It's this tension between trusting in God to produce results and knowing that most of the time he's going to produce those results through our hustle, through our hard work. But at the end of the day, the lot is cast and the results are in the Lord's hands. And whatever result he brings about, we got to be able to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Continue to pray for those prodigals. Continue to pray that God will bring them back, but recognize that he alone can do that work. Right. Mm. Uh, and so I don't know. I just, I have a really good friend who's struggling with this right now. Yeah. Re it's really dark, really, really dark. A uh, child had tried to take his own life mm. recently. Mm. And this is what I told him. I was like, listen, you know, go to Deuteronomy 8, go to First Chronicles 28, where David's talking to Solomon. Wealth and honor come from you alone, for you rule over everything. Power and might are in your hands, and at your discretion, Lord, people are made great and given strength, right? He's saying, I, Lord alone, God alone is responsible for these results. We just got to be faithful in the present. So be faithful do the work of parenting that you believe God's called you to do. But at the end of the day, you got to trust the fruit to the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that brings up another, another key point here, because when you're, t you're talking about trusting God, 
uh, I'm a firm believer in keeping my hand to the plow with my kids. I'm a firm believer. I'm, I'm a firm believer to helping a child find their lane, yeah. find and locate their calling in life. Okay. Uh, when the Bible says train up a child in the way that he should go, we're not sure that training process, me personally, don't think that training process ever ends. I look at yeah, Olympic athletes, man, they start as kids and I see what parents do today for their kids that are on, uh, in a baseball league and they put them in travel ball and they put them out there and they don't just take their kids to the age of 18 and say, all right, you're on your own. Those parents that have invested so very much early on want to push their kids on to college and in, be involved in the process. But yet I see parents today, and this is, this is kind of hard. It's a balance. I see some parents today thinking, well, I got to leave them up to God. When I get them 15 or 16, now it's up to God. Help a parent find balance with that right there. This is so good. Yeah. Uh, I don't see anything in scripture that supports this very popular idea of, quote unquote, letting go and letting God. Mm. Nothing. (laughs) The, the, The passage what people love to point to here is when Moses is leading the Israelites out of Egypt and they come to the Red Sea and Moses says, uh, you need only to be still, right? He says, do not fear. You need only to be still. Guess what God says right after that? Get Mm -hmm. moving, right? So Moses says, hey, listen, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And then right away, God says, hey, that's fine, but this is a stillness of the heart, not a stillness of your legs. You need to run as fast as you possibly can across this sea that I'm going to open up to for you, right? And it's this beautiful picture of this tension you see all throughout Scripture. Trust, hustle, rest. Yes, trust that God is going to fight the battle, but know that he's going to do it through your hard work, through your hustle. And only when you embrace both of these ideas can you truly rest, knowing that you have given the work your all to the day that you die and trusted God for the results, that's when you can step back and truly rest. So I don't think it's either or, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's both and. I think think we're not meant to resolve that tension between trusting and hustling, but embracing it constantly till the day that we die. Yeah. Well, our South Florida culture, the Hispanic culture, culture and with the Cuban population that we have, uh, they're very hands-on. Uh, yeah. I mean, they, they, they want to go ahead and with their kid wants to date, they came from a tradition where they couldn't date unless there was a chaperone. And yeah. that was the old days. Some things have started to become more Americanized because many of our Americans have a mindset that I'm going to let my kid make decisions when their kid yeah. is not prepared for it. And I'm, yeah. I, I hate to think that we would find some kind of guidance based on our culture when the Bible takes it to the standpoint of that, that fatherly influence will always be in the child's life. Yes. And so for exactly. even Jesus at the year of his life where he's praying and saying to him, his own father, I'm with you, you're with me. And now let's be in them. There's still that relationship. So uh, that's really, really good stuff. And I, I like that whole tension. And so here's what I'd like to do. We're getting ready to bring this thing in for a close, but what would you like to just tell us before you leave if this, this podcast today, you got a great book out there, the creator in you, it is for children. Um, but what do you want us to know? Yeah, I, I want kids. I This is just because this is what I'm thinking about all the time these days. I want the kids in the lives of our listeners to understand, contrary to every children's book they've ever read about Genesis 1, the sixth day was not the end of creation. It was the beginning. Yeah. It's when God passed the baton to us and said, hey, kids, I made you in my image. Go fill the earth and subdue it. Work like me. Create with me. And here's why I think this is important for our kids to get. Because when they do, now every time they do an art project or do a chore or do a piece of homework or enter a future career, they're going to see that work with God-ordained purpose and enthusiasm and joy. 
That's what I want the kids and the lives of your listeners to get. That's why I wrote The Creator in You. And this is not a cute book. It is not cartoony. I'm literally framing the artwork in my house because it is for grownups mm-hmm. as much as it is for kids. And our prayer is that this would be a book that your kids take with them to college. Yeah. That they would keep it with them forever and remind themselves that the creator God is in them. And that when they show others in their life, the creator in them, when they create businesses and art and music and culture, they're going to glorify their father. What happened in you to make you want to write this kind of book? Oh, man, such a good question. I spent years as an entrepreneur believing that if I was really sold out for Jesus, I would quit that job and go be a quote-unquote full-time missionary. Hmm. And it wasn't until a mentor of mine heard me talking about this and said, hey, go read Genesis 1 and 2 and come back and tell me what you see. And so I read it. And I went back to him and I said, you know, before God tells us that he is holy or loving or omnipotent or just, God tells us that he's a God who creates. Mm -hmm. And that in and of itself frees me from having to give a religious justification for the work that I do in the world. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, period. And you can do that today as an entrepreneur, as a student as an artist, as a musician, and oh, by the way, make disciples as you're going about that work. So that's what happened in my life. And that message just transformed my perspective on work, on mission, and what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. When Jesus said, go and make disciples, it's actually a terrible translation of Matthew 28. Ask any Greek scholar, the, a, a much better translation is, as you are going, make disciples. Hmm. Jesus assumed that they had already gone as fishermen and tax collectors. He said, as you go about these careers, as you go about these jobs, make disciples of me. By the way, Jesus didn't go more than a couple hundred miles away from his mm-hmm. hometown, yep. ever. Yep. He's a great disciple maker of the world had yeah. ever known. It's not about how far we go. It's about what we do while we are going. Uh, and so that that's what got me so fired up about this, Steve. All right, buddy. Where can they get your book? Hey, Amazon, wherever books are sold. Uh, it's called The Creator and You. And then if you go to jordanrainer.com, fill out the form there, and I'm going to send your kids these beautiful uh, dedication stickers. So it'll say to nice. Jackson, to Emily, may you always abound in the creativity of the Father. I'm going to sign it. They'll get in the mail so they can have that in their book forever. Great. We'll be making all that information available to you, those of you who are listening and watching today. Thanks so much, Jordan, for being with us. Appreciated the time with you. Feeling good today. And let me say to Alan, thanks again, Alan, for making this connection. All things are good in the podcast booth. So thank you, of course, for listening to us and enjoying another episode of the Family Business Podcast with Steve Alessi and Jordan Rayner. God bless you. God bless, Steve. Hey there, if you enjoyed this episode of the Family Business Podcast with the Alessis, then you'll want to know we've got more insight, more encouragement, more great conversations that we can have on Sundays, and even some surprises coming your way. So you want to make sure you subscribe to our channel and watch one of these next videos here next, because remember, family is everybody's business.